So continuing with our discussion of rhetoric and argument, or the principles of argument, we'll discuss today the common logical fallacies. So first of all, what is a logical fallacy? Well, a fallacy, as you may or may not know, is just an error or a mistake. So a logical fallacy is an error in logic or an error in reasoning. And this can be due to a misconception or some, of some kind, or it can be due to a presumption. It can even be intentional. The problem with a logical fallacy is that it can seriously weaken an argument. So why would someone commit a logical fallacy? Well, oftentimes, again, they are unintentional, but some are actually intentionally committed in order to support a weak argument. So when you're looking at your ads for this week for the rhetorical analysis essay, I encourage you to try to see if you can find examples of some of the logical fallacies that we'll discuss today. Um, I guarantee you that there are logical fallacies present in these ads, and uh, it'll be nice if you can identify a few for your essay. So some logical fallacies <clears throat> excuse me, are commonly known by their Latin names. So we'll, we'll be using some Latin terms in today's lecture. I'll make sure to define them pretty well for you, though. So let's begin with the first kind of fallacy. This is referred to as an ad hominem fallacy. So that's some Latin there. Ad means to, and hominem means man or human. So that, that root word hom um, might remind you of homo sapien or something along those lines, which means man. So ad means to, hominem means man or human. So this fallacy literally means to the man. So what is an ad hominem fallacy doing? Well, it's focusing attention on the person rather than on arguments or evidence. This is a fallacy because we expect an argument to be based on evidence, not the people uh, involved in the argument. So here's an example. If an argument were to state that Dr. Stein's book about plant genetics is worthless because he was caught cheating on his wife. Okay, this is an ad hominem fallacy. Obviously, it's quite a silly one. But what does Dr. Stein's knowledge of plants have to do with his marriage? Absolutely nothing. So you could not logically say that Dr. Stein's book about plants is worthless simply because of his personal failings, such as being caught cheating on his wife. So this is obviously kind of an over-the-top example, but again, um, an ad hominem fallacy focuses attention on the person rather than their argument. And we consider that a fallacy because that's not what a strong argument should do. So where have you seen arguments like this before? Well, sad to say, often on the campaign trail. If you think back just a few short months to this last presidential election and more elections than that, just that was a very high profile one, you'll probably remember lots of personal attack or ad hominem fallacies being committed. So the candidates had problems with each other's ideas and policies and suggestions, obviously. But it seemed like oftentimes they also had problems with each other personally, and they would focus on these personal things. So those would be examples of ad hominem fallacies. Okay, so let's move on in that case. That's a pretty easy one to distinguish. Let's talk about a post hoc fallacy. So that's just an abbreviated title. The full title of this fallacy is post hoc ergo propter hoc. So what on earth does that mean? Well, this is Latin as well, and it translates as after this, therefore, because of this. It's also known as the false cause or the questionable cause fallacy. And basically what it's doing is it's saying that because one thing happened after another, it also happened because of it. Now, obviously, that's a fallacy. The fact that something happened after something else doesn't mean that it happened because of it. So there's not necessarily a cause and effect um, relationship there. So... A post hoc fallacy is saying that there is a cause and effect relationship when there probably is not one. So, for example, <clears throat> it's another kind of silly over the top example, but it, it drives the point home. A black cat crossed my path on the way to school. At school, I failed my algebra test. Therefore, I failed my algebra test because the black cat crossed my path. Okay. So, obviously, if you're superstitious, maybe this is the kind of thing that you would um, give credence to. But I think most of us would agree that you probably didn't fail your algebra test <clears throat> because of a black cat. You probably did failed your algebra test because you didn't study. 
So here's another example. That man was listening to hip-hop music before he killed his wife. Therefore, he killed his wife because he was listening to hip-hop music. Okay, um, technically, could those two things have anything to do with each other? Perhaps. But it's not likely that because one happened first and the other happened second that they necessarily had anything to do with each other. So that's what a post hoc fallacy does. It says that there's a cause and effect relationship when in reality it may very well just be that one thing happened first and the other thing happened second and they were completely unrelated. So if you fail your midterm exam, um, I'm going to assume that it wasn't because of any black cats. I'm not going to commit a post hoc fallacy. I'm going to assume probably more correctly that you just did not study. <laughs> but of course, that's not going to apply to any of you because none of you are going to fail that midterm. I can tell I have faith in you. Okay, so the next fallacy we'll discuss is the begging the question fallacy. So this one basically bases an argument on an assumption that has not been proven or is impossible to prove. It's also known as circular reasoning. And basically, begging the question fallacy is where an argument asks the reader to simply accept the conclusion without presenting any real evidence other than the author's opinion itself. So it kind of acts like something has been proven and bases the argument on that, when in reality it has not been proven or it cannot be proven. So why is it called begging the question? Well, it takes its name from the expression to beg off. Um, it's not really a common expression anymore. But begging off something just basically means evading something or avoiding something. So the speaker or writer who commits the begging the question fallacy is evading the question or begging off. So that's why we call it begging the question. Okay, so some examples. First example here. As we all know, children should, not, should be spanked. Therefore, mothers should not be penalized for spanking their children. Okay, so where is the problem with this statement? Well, we don't all know that children should be spanked. So it's begging the question, should children be spanked in the first place? So this um, example here is trying to make it the argument that mothers should not be penalized for spanking their children. And it's basing that whole argument, that's its evidence, on what they say is a fact that, as we all know, children should be spanked. But again, we don't all know that. So some people agree with that strongly and some people disagree with that strongly. So you can't just kind of act like it's already been, been settled because it has not been settled. So another example, <clears throat> euthanasia is a morally virtuous practice because it is good and ethical to help someone escape their suffering. So in this particular example, you can really see um, the circular reasoning. So the problem here is that the argument doesn't actually present any evidence. So the premise, which is that it's good to help someone escape suffering, and the conclusion, which is that euthanasia is morally virtuous, are exactly the same thing. So the point is not proven. So you can't say euthanasia is virtuous because it's good and ethical to help someone, because it hasn't been proven that it is in fact good and ethical to help someone escape their suffering by means of euthanasia. So it's begging the question, wait a minute, is it good and ethical to help someone escape their suffering if that involves killing them? So another example of begging the question. So the next one is entitled the false dichotomy. Now the word dichotomy it includes that, that um, prefix di, which means a separation between two things. So that's more Latin for you. So dichotomy means a separation of two things. And what's happening in this logical fallacy is that the arguer, the speaker, sets up the situation so that it looks like there are only two choices. And this is a fallacy because there usually are many more than just two choices in any given scenario, in any given argument. So the reason why this one works so nicely, if you have a weak argument, is because if you make there be only two choices, and then you eliminate one of those choices, then it seems like you're left with only one option. Obviously, that's the option that the speaker wants you to pick in the first place. So, unfortunately, we saw a whole lot of this on the campaign trail as well. It's very popular with um, election season. So, for example, my fellow Americans, we have only two choices in this election. Vote Senator Green for president or our country falls into ruin. 
So yeah, there probably are more than two options there. If you don't vote Senator Green, it's not likely that there's only one other choice and that that choice is that the country falls into ruin. So there are more than two options. Perhaps there are other candidates that you could vote for. And even if you didn't vote for Senator Green or the other uh, fictional Senator Brown, the pr country probably still would not go to ruin. So you can probably see why it's um, kind of tempting to use this false dichotomy analogy because it really simplifies things. So it's if you don't if you don't do this, if you don't do or think what what I'm suggesting, then this is the only other option. And the only other option is usually a really bad one. So that's the the point of the false dichotomy fallacy. So let's move on to the weak analogy fallacy. So what is an analogy? First of all, an analogy is a comparison between two things, ideas, or situations. Many arguments rely on analogies in order to work. So if the two things being compared don't really have much in common at all, then the argument might be guilty of this fallacy, the weak analogy fallacy. So for example, you could say guns and hammers are both tools made of metal that can be used to kill someone. No one would think about restricting the purchase of hammers, so why would we restrict the purchase of guns? Okay, um, so technically, yes, guns and hammers are both made of metal, but is, is there really a whole lot that the two have in common? Well, not really. This, I would say, is a weak analogy, because hammers have many uses, um, building things, fixing things, etc., whereas guns have pretty much the sole purpose of killing something, or at the very least, practicing as if to kill something. Whereas a hammer has many um, practical uses and completely harmless uses, it's true that it can be used to kill someone, but that is not its original intent. And in fact, many things can be used to kill someone or something, um, despite their original intent. So you couldn't really say, okay, well, we would never restrict the purchase of hammers, so why would we ever restrict the purchase of guns? Well, the two really don't have that much in common. You cannot build an analogy based on a comparison between these two things. They're simply not enough alike. So this is a nice example of a weak analogy. So the bandwagon fallacy. This one you may already be familiar with. So it's derived from the popular expression to jump on the bandwagon, which means to do something just because everyone else is doing it. And it relies on the fallacy that what is popular is what is right, which is surprisingly um, a popular notion. So for example, nine out of 10 Americans prefer Colgate toothpaste. Isn't it time you use the best? So why is this a fallacy? Because once again, the fact that something is popular does not necessarily mean that it's right. But that's what this fallacy is trying to convince you to do. It's convincing you based on the assumption that if you think something is popular, then you will likely think it's correct as well. Okay, so next we have the straw man fallacy. So in order to understand the straw man fallacy, you first have to kind of envision what they're talking about here with a straw man. So imagine that a warrior is battling an opponent, but the opponent is made out of straw. The opponent is a straw man rather than a real man. Well, wouldn't it be easy to win um, against an assailant like that? Or you couldn't even really say it's an assailant against a, a target like that. So why is it easy to win against a straw man? Because he's not a real opponent. He doesn't put up any kind of fight the way that a real person would. So that's exactly what a straw man fallacy is guilty of. It's presenting the opposing side as being so extreme in a negative way um, or so weak that no one would agree with it. So the straw man fallacy kind of relies on misrepresenting the opposing side to make it easier to argue against that opposing side. So for example, this is, I guess, a straw man, a scarecrow, that you can envision that. And wow, the, the whole fail thing is kind of old at this point. You can tell this... <laughs> The slideshow is kind of aging itself here with the fail reference. Okay, so for example, um, I don't know if you're familiar with 
the organization PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. A lot of people have a lot of problems with PETA because of their um, seemingly extreme tactics that they use to, to fight for animal rights. But this example is saying, PETA supports the bombing and destroying of laboratories. Okay, so that may have been true in a specific case, but it doesn't really represent the organization or its work fairly. So based solely on that piece of information, which is a straw man fallacy, it's making PETA, it's reducing PETA down to this one incident. So based solely on that, no one would support PETA. So that really is what the straw man fallacy is relying on. If it can simplify things enough, if it can weaken an argument enough by oversimplification, then that argument will hopefully be easier to fight. Okay, so the last one we'll consider is the hasty generalization fallacy. So this is a fallacy that makes sweeping generalizations based on an insufficient amount of evidence. So an example here might be, okay, well, I went fishing yesterday on Lake Livingston and I didn't catch any fish. Therefore, there are no fish in Lake Livingston. So, okay, the fact that you went fishing one day and didn't catch any fish does not mean that there were no fish in Lake Livingston. So this was definitely a hasty generalization, a hasty conclusion, um, because you simply did not have enough evidence to make a sweeping conclusion like that. 